Okay, um, let's start with let's start with the right slide. Um, continuing off from last time, talking about Jean Locke. Now we are going to talk about Montesquieu et Rousseau. I'm not going to talk too much about Rousseau, but you've already read Rousseau, so uh, you know a little bit about him. He's radical. Um, Montesquieu is like the French John Locke, so he's more radical than Locke, but not as radical as Rousseau. Um, uh, and he is, it's actually, I just recorded a lecture for APUSH um, about the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution. He is extremely influential. He's more influential um, than Locke in a lot of ways uh, over the, um, the kind of separation of powers that we have in the United States, as we'll see. Um, and he, his writings about republicanism were incredibly influential over um, the kind of founding generation, right, of the at least you know, white property men um, uh, of the United States. So what's happening with these guys? Montesquieu and Rousseau are writing at about the same time. This is the reign of Louis the XIV, or 14, the Sun King. Um, this is Versailles and all that. You can you remember this stuff from back in the day. Uh, L'état c'est moi. I am the state is the famous phrase of Louis the 16th that whatever the, I do is what the state does whatever the state does I do let us um a you know a strong leader who whatever they say goes and there uh, there is no right whatever they say is the the law of the land um and that's that let us uh Louis the 14th the sun king um, so it is a time of extreme decadence and they don't like it and they write about it. Um, uh, Montesquieu writes in one way, Rousseau writes in another. And with this lecture, I just want to give you a little bit of background because again, this is introduction kind of ethics, philosophy stuff. I want to introduce you to some of the terminology, right? Like utilitarianism or you know, dialectical materialism or whatever, the kind of the, 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 the lingo that you need to know in order to really talk about this stuff. So these guys are what we would call methodological collectivists. So that methodological meaning like their methodology, like how do they do their thing? How do they think about philosophy? How do they write philosophy? How do they, what kind of prescriptions do they give for ethics, philosophy, etc.? So a methodological collectivist is someone who, yeah, there's so much stupid French and this is dumb. Um, they, there's something, right? A general, for, for Montesquieu, he calls it a general spirit. For Rousseau, he talks about and writes about the general will. Um, this is just like a, some, there's something, right? That you get enough people together in a society and it's just something, right? Marx talks about this when he talks about like labor and productivity. Um, so there's a lot of continental philosophers who we would consider methodological collectivists. They write about the collective, right? Something happens when you have these people together, you get something that's greater than the sum of its parts. Um, this is not what the British political economists and philosophers practice, which would be methodological individualism. This is Hobbes, this is Locke, this is Adam Smith, where it's the individual, right? What does one rational being do, think? How should they act? And then you just like, you know, stereotype that being out. Now we got a thousand of those people. We got 10,000 of those people eh, 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 walking around like little automatons, right? All thinking and acting in a very logical way. You, 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 I, I, you can see maybe a, a little bit of my bias here. Um, certainly methodological individualism is very important to think about like what makes people rational, right? Um, how do we use logic or passion or emotion in just making decisions? Um, but certainly to the, some of the English political economists, maybe Adam Smith in particular, they take it a little bit far, right? And so the, the, my kind of lampooning of the methodological individualism is to say that it is not, it is not 
the be all end all. Um, nor is methodological uh, uh, collectivism, right? You can't, if you focus too much on the general will or the general spirit, what you're going to do is you're going to marginalize individual needs, right? So if it's too much about like, you know, I mean, I mean, you see this, right, with the, the botched attempts at implementing a, you know, communist utopia in any number of countries, uh, that the, the spirit on the methodological collective, right, on the, the general will, the desires of the people, the proletariat, um, has not been great for uh, some individuals. Um, contrastingly, right, when we look at methodological individualism, right, if it's all against all for Hobbes, or even if your ambition checks my ambition in Adam Smith, well, um, turns out, you know, when people are just, you know, checking each other's ambitions and competing, um, it's not very good either, right? That you kind of have a general um, ramping up of, uh, of competition and ultimately um, of, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of consequences like um, what, in what in economic circles they call negative externalities, Right, bad things that you didn't think about that are outside of your little beep boop equations. Um, environment like climate change is a negative externality, right? Um, so you got to read them both. You got to figure out your way. I'm, and I've been talking too much about this. All right. Um, both of them are influenced by what they are reading about, not seeing. They didn't come to the United States. Later, we'll read um, Tocqueville who's another Frenchman uh, who actually comes to the United States and writes about it, writes a book, Democracy in America, very important book. Um, but uh, they don't, they're just reading about it, right? So Tocqueville, or excuse me, for uh, Montesquieu and Rousseau, they're reading about French imperialism and the savages, right? And the developed societies and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's look at a little bit of background here. Um, he builds on Locke. I think actually uh, some scholars of Montesquieu suggest that he actually misreads Locke, that he read Locke or he heard of Locke, and he misunderstands this division of legislative, executive, and federal. That's Locke's division. He doesn't say nothing about the judiciary, right? Legislative, executive, and federal. Montesquieu uh, is the one who brings in the judicial, so legislative, executive, and judicial. So in a funny kind of twist of fate, um, a Frenchman misunderstanding an Englishman's writing about political economy and the division of powers, uh, the balance of power actually comes up with something that is then transported to the United States. Um, the Spirit of the Law is one of his famous books. It's the one that our reading is excerpted from. I'm not going to get into the specifics of the reading. You can see my man is into threes. He's like Hegel in this, right? There's God and philosophy and then there's legislative, executive and, and um, uh, uh, judicial. Um, and he divides the book into three parts. The first is about classifications of government, good ones, bad ones, um, meh ones, uh, separation of powers, and then climate and the law, which is a little like, ee, a little bit like, you know, 18th century biological or, or geographic determinism, like, you know, it's cold in France, so we work harder, uh, and it's hot in Haiti, so people should be slaves. Um, I'm, I'm lampooning the, uh, his takes, but they're, they're kind of like that, right? They're kind of not, it's like, eh, let's just read the first two parts and just, you know, miss me with that third part. Um, and we're not going to read it. Um, so why do people obey is something that Montesquieu is interested in. Um, what makes a government legitimate? How do you, how does a government have legitimacy? Right. Yes, consent of the governed is the famous phrase from Locke and other English political philosophers. Um, but Montesquieu is also asking this question. Um, and again, major influence on American Revolution. And I'll show you a little bit here, just a couple excerpts from the Spirit of the Laws. Um, uh, this is something that I make much of in teaching. And it's important when people hearken as they as is, uh, politicians want sometimes to hearken back to the founders and the Republican vision and blah, 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 blah. Um, so a lot of things have changed. Uh, and one of which is I challenge you to find politicians that refer to people as citizens. Um, politicians talk about taxpayers. There's a big difference there. 
It's a rhetorical difference, but there is a deep, profound political implication of understanding oneself as a citizen, right, with in a Republican form of government. Again, this, I don't mean like Republican and Democrat. I mean Republican in the Roman sense or in Montesquieu's sense of the word, the 18th century sense of the word. Um, if you are a citizen of a republic, you are bound to other citizens, people who are not like, again, and again, we can do all the caveats and footnotes. It's only 10% of the population. Um, you know, women can't vote. There's slavery, um, all of this stuff. And I'm talking specifically about the United history of the United States, but this is where Montesquieu is so influential. If you are a citizen, you have ethical duties, right? That you have, you are, you are connected to other citizens. Um, you come together in the public square, right? This is what people like to talk about. And you debate and you hash out laws and this, that, the other. Um, if you're a taxpayer, you don't, get, you don't care about anyone else, right? What's the point of being a taxpayer? Keeping your tax bill low, right? So that is a fundamental difference in understanding of Republican virtue. And it's something that, again, keep, come show, show me. Show me politicians that talk about citizens or citizens. I mean, citizenship, sure, like getting your citizenship. But I mean, that refer to people as citizens and not taxpayers. That's a really profound shift. It's something that's happened in, say, the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and I, I would argue that there are very profound implications for that. Um, but you may disagree. We can talk about it in class. Um, so to, to wit, as they say, to that end, um, here's a few quotes from uh, Montesquieu. To love democracy is to love frugality. Democracy ought to provide everyone with the same happiness and the same advantages, the same pleasures and the same expectations. This can be done only by frugality on the part of all. You got to be cheap. Right? You got to be cheap. You got to be frugal. You've got to live simply that this is a kind of Spartan understanding of Republican virtue. And that is the key, right? Once you have people, you know, you know, flexing on others with their money or whatever, we're going to have a problem to this other point on wealth. Montesquieu, what's he think? Continuing on, right? And this is in the Spirit of the Laws, chapter three. Uh, the love of frugality, frugality limits the citizen's desire for possessions, uh, to concern for providing what is required by his family and something more for country. Uh, taxes, right? Or something. Um, riches give citizens power which they cannot use for themselves. Were they to do that, they would no longer be equal. Um, that when people start accumulating wealth, we get inequality. When you have inequality, you don't have a Republican form of government anymore, right? People are in are not equal, and that is the road to aristocracy. That is the road to empire. That is a road away from um, the Republican asceticism of Montesquieu, right? The minimalist kind of understanding of um, what a republic uh, republic looks like. Um, Last point on this, right? So we, we associate republicanism with democracy frequently. Republicanism can have, uh, um, uh, uh, can be inter almost interchangeable in American political discourse. Democracy isn't the same thing as capitalism, right? This is not a controversial or spicy take. It's just a statement of fact, right? So when we look at republican virtues and we think about, again, Rewinding the clock back to the 18th century and what someone like Montesquieu or Jefferson um, or even Hamilton to some degree um, thought about when they thought about republicanism, it was this kind of stuff, right? It was this kind of stuff. Hamilton to a lesser extent, right? Because he's fine with making, right? With regenerating wealth. Um, but even for Hamilton, if you look at his report on manufacturing, I'm sorry, I'm getting like a push stuff here now in my mind. Uh, his 1791 report on manufacturing, um, it's, uh, yeah, we don't need to get into it, right? We don't need to, wh why, why am I doing, I shouldn't do these after I do a push lectures. Um, and that ain't even in the a push lecture. Uh, anyway, democracy is not the same as capitalism. Capitalism does encourage, right, wealth, the production of wealth. Um, it does, it doesn't encourage frugality. Um, and it is something, right, the taxpayers, right, we think about each other as taxpayers, um, when we want to save our money and not like, you know, 
sacrifice ourselves to the good of the republic. People don't really want to do that anymore, right? They want to have some uh, some Yeezys and a chocolate milk and call it a day. Uh, anyway, that's Montesquieu. We'll talk about him more in class, or if you've maybe we've already talked about him, depending on when you watch this. It is very very late at night. Um, see you soon.